in Youth Studies here at Carleton University. We're so pleased that you're here and you've chosen to join us for this auspicious occasion as we gather to learn from the insights of Louise Huff, Canada's ninth Parliamentary Poet Laureate. As it so happens, we are gathered here on Louis Riel Day, which recognizes the contributions and legacy of Louis, Louis, I guess I should say, Riel, <laughs> um, a visionary Métis leader in Canadian history who defended Métis rights and way of life. I would like to begin our event tonight by sharing the land acknowledgement that we use in IIS to open our departmental meetings and events. As we begin this meeting today, we wish to acknowledge that we live, work, and gather on the, tr the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. The peoples of the Anishinaabeg Algonquin Nation have lived on this territory for millennia, and their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. As a department with programs organized around confronting anti-racism and decolonization, we recognize the ways in which our presence on this land upholds colonialism and reproduces dispossession and violence for indigenous people. For those of us who are settlers, we commit to working and learning more about how we can prioritize upholding conditions of the treaties that govern this land. In addition to the gratitude that we have for the traditional custodians of this land, I want to express thanks to the individuals who have worked to make this event possible. First and foremost, I want to thank Madeline Dion Stout herself, who is responsible for the endowment of this lecture series and is joining us virtually tonight to share some thoughts following the lecture. Our Indigenous Studies colleagues, particularly Omiyasu, were vital in shaping the vision for this event. And our associate director, Patricia Gentile, I think we've, I feel like we should raise hands out there. Where's Omiyasu? <laughs> We're vital in shaping the vision for this event. Um, Pat, in particular, has worked tireless, tirelessly to organize many of the details that made tonight possible. Our institute administrator, Femi Ajitahan, Femi, <laughs> in the back has also provided invaluable support, especially with the financial and logistical aspects. So we really appreciate all of you for your help and support in bringing this together. Now, as we look toward the much anticipated lecture this evening, we are so honored to have Elder Barry Saracen to open tonight's event. Barry is a proud member of the Algonquins of Pickanagawan First Nation, which is situated on the shores of Golden Lake and the Bonshear River. Barry is part of a men's drumming group and teaches on the traditional drum called the Kichisipi Rini. Did I say that right, Barry? <laughs> as well as sharing Thunderbird songs in the community. Barry is also a traditional powwow dancer and has been on the powwow committee since 1987. He is a husband, father, brother, and devoted community man who works diligently for cultural and language vitalization. And we're so grateful that he is here to generously share his wisdom and blessings for this evening's event. Please join me in welcoming Elder Barry Saracen. Koi. Thank you, Julie. Abi Zangi Nuo, Pokwakan Khan Donjba. I'm uh, happy to be here. My uh, Anishinaabe name is uh, Abitang. It means uh, the spirit that came out of the water. He was a man with long black hair and wore a uh, beautiful uh, deerskin uh, outfit. He said he's going to be with me from the time that I, he's with me. And uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, well, what does that mean, Abby Tung? And I tell them, it means uh, somebody uh, that can analyze things and learn things. And, and uh, that's the way uh, our people uh, live in terms of, uh, you know, knowing who we are, where we come from. My uh, clan is called the White uh, Wolf Clan. And uh, 
It's been uh, beautiful. I lived here in about 1982 to 87, uh, going to school down here. I took a business course at Algonquin College, and I sang with uh, a lot of different people uh, from around the Great Lakes, and I know that there's a exhibit here on Norval Morso, and one of his uh, younger brothers uh, sang with us. His name is Wolf Morso, and he did similar work as Norval. So we're uh, the men that traveled around the Great Lakes, and we learned uh, traditional Thunderbird songs, and uh, within the Thunderbird drums. There's a male and a female drum that came down a long time ago, before anybody came across this ocean here and found our land. And uh, so that's where our language comes from, from the spirit to the Thunderbirds. And I'd like to uh, sing an honor song for uh, Louise. I met her last night and it was very beautiful lady, and uh, in our area too, we had uh, a lot of our elders that uh, went through uh, residential schools, and uh, very uh, beautiful people to know our elders and, and to keep up the traditions and the cultures. So we uh, shared some stories, uh, Louise and I, and in terms of uh, the type of foods that we ate. Our language is similar. They would say tanse, and we would say kwe kwe. But I'm sure if she under, had uh, been more communication, like if I said, I need this Asian Madison, how are you? She would probably understand me, so that's how wide our language goes. And also met her daughter, a uh, beautiful woman. I translated her name in our language, which means uh, So it was a very beautiful uh, reception we had last night. And uh, it was a good meal. So the song that I'm going to sing to welcome uh, each and every one of you, and uh, especially uh, um, Louise. So the song translates out to Gije Eje Wok Nene Wok Kawana Be Young In De Wake Nikanik Hey, 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 oh, hey. It means the grandfather spirit of these traditional drums who pass on our language to us. And the elders received that language from the spirits of uh, Animiki Ka, the thunderbirds, the ones that you hear that fly in the spring when you hear the big thunder in the sky. Those are what the ones that brought down the drums from the uh, the Creator, or God. In our language, we call God uh, Manado, or Nanabojou. A lot of people think we're saying Bojou, Bojou when we, when we um, meet each other. But we're not saying Bonjour. We're saying the short form for Nanabojou. So, we would say Boju, whether we're Cree or Ojibwe or Algonquin. So, that's uh, the song I'd like to sing. And it comes from one of the elders way up in the Kanara area. From the traditional drums. They had to uh, put the uh, traditional drums underground in the 1930s to about 1960s because they wanted to burn their drums. They wanted to burn our pipes. They wanted to try to bury us or to erase us from this continent here, but uh, 
they wouldn't let us do that. So this is one of the songs that we'd like to sing for you. This one is say me gwech and uh, the directions from the east would be Wabanang and the south Shawanang, Ishkwandem and the western door it's called Ipong Gishkamoch basically it means where the sun rises and sets and over here is the Kiwedanang the uh, northern door spirits and there's three white spirits that sit in that doorway. The first one is the Wabana or uh, Wabshke Mayingan, Wabshke Makwa, and Wabshke uh, Pajaki, the white, the white buffalo. So with that, I would like to welcome you with this welcoming song. Yeah. 
so much, Elder Berry, for that wonderful performance. Next, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Carmen Robertson is the Canada Research Chair in North American Indigenous Visual and Material Culture in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and is jointly appointed between the School for Studies in Art and Culture, the Institute of Interdisciplinary Studies, and the Institute for Comparative Studies in Literature, Art, and Culture. As a Scots Lakota professor of art history, her research centers around contemporary indigenous arts and constructions of indigeneity in popular culture. It's no coincidence that we are here in the Carleton University Art Gallery, surrounded by the amazing work of Anishinaabe artist Norval Morisot. As Professor Robertson currently leads the large shirk funded grant called the Morisot Project. In 2016, Robertson published both Norval Morisot Art and Life and Mythologizing Norval Morisot, Art in the Colonial Narrative in Canadian Media. So without further, further ado, please welcome Dr. Carmen Robertson. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, Elder Barry, for starting us off in such a good way. That amazing song, I love that. Well, healing is a powerful force that touches all of us in different ways. And it's often through story and storytelling that we experience pathways for healing. The setting for this year's lecture, the Madeline Stout, a Dion Stout lecture, adds to the healing force of our gathering this evening, as did that amazing song. I never would have imagined that I would have had the opportunity to introduce Louise Health, who is here to share with us her healing narratives this evening in a space surrounded by the healing and storied art of Anishinaabe artist Norval Morisot. Anishinaabe curator Daniel Printup and I co-curated Medicine Currents, and my heart is soaring that uh, these amazing paintings are here to hear the song and to the words of Louise Health. Uh, they're both very powerful artists who are committed to furthering resilience in our communities and in our world. It's my honor to introduce the award-winning Cree poet Louise Health, I'm from Treaty 4 territory in Saskatchewan, and I grew up in a small town where poetry was unheard of, or at least in my family. Um, all that changed when I attended a poetry reading by Louise in Regina. An amazing storyteller, I was unprepared for the transformative power of her poetry. Her affirmative words, affirming words, weave together complicated narratives related to the past, the present, and the future. And her reading inspired me to buy my first book of poetry, Blue Marrow, which was a finalist for the Governor General's Award in 1998. She's written five award-winning books of poetry, and her most recent book is Oasis, Kinky and Disheveled, published by Brick, Books, the premier publishing house uh, for poetry in Canada. I was at the Sask Book Awards uh, in 2017 when her um, book, Burning in Midnight Dream, was the big winner as well. So I feel connected here. In addition to her award for specific books of poetry, Louise Health has been awarded numerous prestigious awards for literary excellence, including the Latner uh, Writers Trust Award in 2017 for her body of work and the 2020 Kloppenberg Award. She served as the Poet Laureate in Saskatchewan in 2005, and in 2021, she became Parliament's ninth Poet Laureate. Uh, Louise Bernice Health, 
whose Cree name is Sky Dancer, lives uh, with her husband, Peter, outside of Saskatoon. They have two grown daughters, and as Julie mentioned, her daughter, Omiyasu, is here today and is a faculty member and a colleague to us all. We're very lucky. And I am going to stop talking, and because I know that you're all much more excited to hear from our speaker, I invite um, Louise Health to the stage. Just because we're using the podium, which is usually a sign that says no food and drinks in the gallery. Um, please, no food or drinks in the gallery. I'm just going to push this over here. There, that's better. Can <laughs> My Cree name is loosely translated Sky Dancer. I am from Treaty 6 territory, and my daughter is here, Omiyasu, and I do have a son. His name is Asini. <laughs> um, I'm so delighted to be here, and I want to thank Patricia and her uh, cohorts for bringing me here for this wonderful talk in honor of Madeline Dion Scott. Stout, who I went to um, residential school with many years ago. Mind you, she's of a different vintage as I am, but we all, both went to Blue Quills. And um, so I'm really grateful to be here that, and that the audience that is listening. And one of the things I would like to do, and I'm going to try something different tonight, is uh, and I've never done this before. I, re I believe in speaking from my heart. I don't like to write papers for a presentation, but I thought, well, I'll do a little bit something unusual. So um, I want to share with you a little bit of the story of where I came from, and then th th and that's the telling, okay? Telling is really, really easy. Uh, the showing is really, really different. The telling is usually usually using jargon like intergenerational trauma, the showing is sharing the story of what actually happened. So I don't like to sanitize my words. I like to um, uh, be direct, because I don't have time to BS. <laughs> I'm getting too old for that. But I also wanted to thank Barry for that beautiful, beautiful song. I, um, I just love it when the elders share their songs and, you know, I just want to jump up and do the round dance or do something a little bit joyous because that's what music does and that was, that's what the drum does. So way back in 1973, um, I was about 18, but I had left school at the age of 16 from residential school. How many of you are aware of that history? Okay, good. So I don't have to tell you what happened in terms of what the government, um, I call them savages, the government savages because they did stuff to us and they ravaged the land. And so did the churches. So way back when I was 16, when I left that system, I didn't know who I was, where I was going, what my dreams were, what my goals were, and how I was going to do it. Residential school didn't prepare me for that. In fact, I was so lost. I have brown skin. I knew I was Cree, I was a native. But who am I? And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of adolescents always ask themselves that, who am I? Am I right? Yeah. And how am I going to get there? 
who's going to be my guide? Well, both my, both my parents went to residential school. The, my father went to grade six, my mother went to grade four. And the conditions were horrific. So by the time we came home, um, we didn't have a home to come to. In the summer times, we'd go and see our parents. And, um, but we didn't know how to talk to them because that relationship had been severed. So when I was in the mountains, where I met my husband of 50 years now, um, and, and, and believe me, in my community, being with your partner for 50 years is a milestone. It doesn't normally happen. And increasingly, I'm watching that in mainstream as well. But um, <clears throat> during that period of time, when I went to, um, I, between, the, between the ages of 16 and 21, I, I ruined my life. I was an alcoholic, a practicing alcoholic. I slept where whoever I damn well felt like it. I was not a nice person, to be honest. And then, but you know what? Those lessons taught me who I am today. Difficult, difficult lessons. And many of us, if many of you, if you're honest with yourself, will have to examine that part of yourself to know, yes, I made some mistakes. They were terrible choices. But those choices, that's another word. Choices, I didn't know what choice was. I didn't know that around every choice that I made, there was a consequence. I didn't know that. And I didn't have parents to guide me, to show me self-respect because I didn't see that at home. Remember, I didn't grow up with my parents as a child. I was in residential school watching the nuns and the French supervisors and the priests and others supervising us, telling us how to think. Or no, no actually, don't think. Don't talk. Don't trust. Don't feel. And all of these things that now I make a point of breaking all those rules. Because all of us here don't have time to sit on our butts and be told to be quiet. We need to get active and start speaking up for ourselves and for what we believe in. So in the, in the mountains where I met my, my, my partner, I started dreaming. I went off alcohol. I lived in a tent in a teepee with my parents for that year. They were still practicing. And I grew up in family violence, a lot of dysfunction. So during that period of time, I started to dream. And I really pay attention to all my dreams, whether they're nightmares or things that tell me stories. Or and before I fall asleep, sometimes I'll ask my dream place, what is the answer to this problem? And sometimes the answer is not there immediate. I might have to wait a week or so. Anyway, my grandfather, I used to watch him. And here's the poem. This is the showing, OK? I used to watch him take his paper and read. And this is the difference between the telling and a story sharing. It's called Thoughts in the Midst. The dreaming began in the rock slopes where the sun dipped into the ocean's darkness where I was invited. My grandfather appeared propped on his bed, a book or maybe a calendar in his hand. He traced the L's, the V's, the triangles, the dashes, as if he was reading Braille. And then my four grandmothers directed me to the altar, to the earth altar. They kept a stern eye as I greeted them. Years later, I saw my grandfather's billowed walk across the heavens. One leaned on his cane. The other smiled down at me. My grandmother's 
my grandmother's skunks, bears, their scent, scent waffling through the aspen where I hunted in my attempt to find them. For years I dreamt of snakes swimming in unclear waters. A snake wrapped its body around my pregnant belly. I've sat among them as they crackled the grass rolled into balls. Occasionally, from this orgy, they'd lift their heads to study me. I sang to them. Sometimes a moose calf, a bear cub, or a pony would course through my body. I call her a wasis, a spirited child that was loaned to me at birth. We play in the adult's playground, created belly ache and mischief. I wondered where she came from. I had forgotten she existed. I slew old layers, layers of skin until snow wrinkled creases dipped etched on my face. My knees worked hard to keep me up. I am a bald eagle surveying the landscape where home used to be. So in essence, what I've told you in that poem is that the dreams began. And um, those are an accumulation of dreams over the years. <clears throat> and then after my husband finished school, we moved to Northern Saskatchewan, where I kept a journal. How many of you keep a journal? Super. <laughs> and you, one of the things I need you to understand, in residential school, I wasn't a reader, and I wasn't a good writer, and I still make up words in my old age. I, t I asked my husband one day, or my, my daughter, she was talking about marriage, and I said, well, are you guys going to write a um, pre-Neptune? And we killed her laughing because she knew that it meant pre. Yeah. <laughs> so I make up words and I get a good laugh. And I call, I call that a wasis. A wasis is the child that's inside every one of us. And she likes to come out and play. Okay. Anyway, words are like beadwork. They're not perfect because Bead workers know that they put, need to put a skip a line or put a little the wrong bead when they're doing bead work because life isn't perfect. I, you know, when people say to me when, uh, when I've done something right in front of them, they say, perfect. And I go, uh, don't say that to me again, I tell them. Great. <laughs> so <clears throat> when I was... My children would go off to school, my daughter and my son, and I would go into the woods with my journal. And um, you see, I used to be afraid of the woods because when I was growing up during the summer months when we were home with our parents, there'd be so much violence and my mother would escape us in the woods and we would hide in the woods. So hiding in the woods didn't become my friend became a frightening place to be. So in keeping the journal and going into the woods by myself, I would ask the roses, how come your thorns are so prickly and you're so beautiful? I'd ask all of these plants around me and I'd write my answers in my journal. And also the other thing that I learned how to do was to read because my children could read but I was a slow reader. It was something that it wasn't nurtured again. I, did, I still don't know how to use a library. I asked people, could, could, go, go look up that book for me. Or I listened very carefully and I asked for books that are recommended to me. And then I say, oh, go buy that book. Because I, they're overwhelming. It's like coming to Ottawa. There's traffic everywhere. And I'm going, oh my God. I'm, 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 from, I'm a prairie woman. 
I live in a country, it's nice and quiet, and I just say, oh, geez, it's too heavy for me. But anyway, so I, I would keep these journals, and I asked myself very hard and difficult questions. And you have to be when you're doing and having a discussion with a great mystery, because the great mystery is inside you. That's what the elders say. What does your heart say? What does your heart think? So that's what I would do. So that is how I started to write. And you know, people say writing is therapeutic. Believe me, it's not. <laughs> because what you're doing, how many of you have a compost pail? Okay, a slop pail, do you know what a slop pail is? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's throwing all your slop and your compost in a bucket and you're just stirring and stirring and it's not a pretty sight. Well, that's what writing does. And then as you're working it through, some lovely seed pops up and it starts to grow. But that lovely seed may have thorns like the roses and that's okay. Because what the writing does is it exposes you the patterns of your thoughts. And what the elders say is, puneta, when it's something negative and you're, you're um, you know, obsessing about it, they say, puneta. And that means, put the fire of thought out. Okay? Fire is a spirit. And we are that spirit. Esquil, the woman. Woman, we are fire. Women are the water carriers because we give birth. So, you know, uh, one of the things in my discovery of writing and reading and uh, exploring words, I explore words in my language, I explore words in English. English is a bastard language after all, right? So I go to Greek and you know, I Greek, go to Greek and I go to Latin and I try to find out where did this word originate? Well, I found out since I'm a born again pagan, okay, that pagan actually means at the hearth, at the fireplace. Because where we tell ghost stories and our dirty little jokes, we're sitting in front of the fire telling stories. That's where a story happens. We are all pagans, but most people don't want to believe that. So the old man used to say, as we did our ceremonies, the sun dance, the walking out ceremony for the babies, the goose dance, the sweat lodge, the fasting, our feasts, he would say, this is our psychology. This is our psychiatry. Well, in my recovery, I had to see a Western psychiatrist. I had a wonderful psychiatrist. I had a wonderful psychologist. And then I went to ceremony psychiatry at home. And what I discovered, if you take those words apart, is psyche actually means wind, soul, and spirit. So when you're looking after yourself and you're going for counseling, don't be ashamed to say, I just saw the greatest psychiatrist, you know, because I'm learning how to breathe properly, you know, so. So that's what helped me along in my journey. So um, I want to read you what I call the poem, Traveling On. Four children, my, my brothers, my two brothers, my sister and myself, we stood helplessly as our father kicked and punched our mother against the fridge. Her arms slashed and bloody hung by her side. Men, the men repeated the scenario the unavoidable transition of female hormones pushed the woman's rage that filled their household. The 
their children scattered beneath the beds, became conflict avoiders, became people pleasers. Others in different households are pimped out by loving addicted parents. Yes, the doctrine of discovery, 1493, the Holy Father, the King, explorers, claim souls, rape the land. The dead served last rites, were more worthy than the living heathen. John A. MacDonald, 1883. The, the buffalo were gone. We were to be starved into submission. Our legs were sticks, bellies protruded. We ate ga grass to survive. Many did not. The Indian Act, 1857. There is no room to find myself. I am a number, a caged Indian. The government controls our lives and the treaties are ignored. The Potlatch Law and Section 141, 1884. The Sundance tree was charcoal. We could no longer share what little we had. Duncan Campbell Scott, 1920. We continue be, to be the Indian problem. War is conducted on our children. Benevolent genocide by black robe pedophiles. The White Paper, 1969. The three-piece suit savages attempt to make white Indians of all our nations. Bill C-31, 1985. Women become foreigners amongst their own. White brides become Indians. Feminist savages in three-piece suits reside in comfortable institutes that feed off us. In plain sight now, homeless in our bodies, wandering spirit haunting the con concrete streets and alleys. How many of us are still seeking our spirits? <clears throat> so that poem was about my inheritance from the residential school survivors of my parents, what history imposed on them. Because my father couldn't get off the reserve without a permit. A lot of white people don't know that. We couldn't go into town with a, with, because the signs would say, no Indians allowed. So my father and my mother inherited that. Can you imagine the rage? the disempowerment of a free people, of course, it's internalized. It's internalized, and it becomes internal in terms of they not only direct to their self, their suicide, and there's family violence, and then my mother becomes a victim, and she has PMS, which I never was aware of. It was not diagnosed, and then me, and my brother and my sister, the inheritors of not only residential school from them and their families, I carried that rage with PMS and endometriosis. I never hit my children, but I had rage, violent rage that I would just, you know, have you ever seen a person really angry? Yeah. And so I pass that on to my children. They watch that. And then they become the intergenerational trauma of residential school and of history. It's passed on from generation to generation. So everybody, all of you here in this room have inherited something from your mom and dad. 
every single one of us, we are not free from that inheritance unless we know how to stop it. That doesn't mean every inheritance is negative. Some people are fortunate to have loving parents. Us and I family, we are emotionally abandoned, physically abandoned, morally abandoned. Boundaries didn't come easy to me. If I saw a good looking guy, I want him, boy. You know, I was, my eyes would be flirting like crazy. You know, so learning boundaries was difficult. I had to learn self-respect. I had to learn discipline. And I taught myself that. <clears throat> this one was called the umbilical sinew. I walk the land where dreams seed and grow, where the farmer's plow severs me in two. I wear a crown of penises where the valley bed bled between my legs. In my decapitation, I think it must have been my fault. I wasn't good enough to walk these dreams. In that brick school, a black woman delivered a globe, showed us the great water she crossed to come and speak to us. Some people started to dream. A nun authored an essay, entered a shy 10-year-old into a public speaking contest. She lost half her lines. She learned to, to re read the water roar she learned to hear the water roar and rumble over rocks that held her down. Crickets and cicadas fiddled, crows, magpies, Baltimore Orioles sang, monarchs flew from her mouth, the eagle flew. In the night sky, the ribbon dancers swirled her success. A kitchen cook whose crippled hands served porridge, pulled pork, roast sausage, dried meatloaf that clogged the throats. She sang Aries and printed the song on an illiterate teen. In her adult years, she flew to Paris to listen to the opera. The, grow, the boys, grown men with fists and boots, took their skates and bats, became champions, wounded warriors in the streets, teachers and lawyers. And now, I fill this shallow grave where I'm licking my wounds, hoping I've left some good behind. You see, that poem tells you that some of us who have survived worked really, really hard to get where I'm at. Look at Madeline and what she's done for this university. This young woman who left, one of my peers, left illiterate from residential school. She took herself to Paris to go and listen to the opera. Illiterate. And I asked her, how did you get there? She said, I just asked. We learned how to ask. And that little girl who the nun nurtured for a public speaking contest, became a public speaker. Some of the boys who are became wonderful sports people up with their skates in residential school, even though they, sometimes they skated on their ankles, became great hockey players, baseball players. I can name you dozens and dozens of Native people who are doctors and lawyers and, and, and nurses and everything. My son's a physician as my grandsons are, my daughter's a professor, and she's an artist, you know. So I'm really proud that some of us have made it out there. <clears throat> so with, with, with you know, um, it's really important as women that we examine, and this is a great book, write it down, um, Menopausal Manifesto. 
written by a gynecologist. For those of you who are entering menopause, be prepared. <laughs> because, um, like I stated earlier, uh, PMS rages, okay? Endometriosis are not working too well for us women. And believe me, I did everything under my power to try to get that under control. I had a vitamin B shot on my bum. I took evening primrose oil, like they said. I gave up coffee and tea and sodas. I used to jog like crazy. I exercised with Jane Vonda, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so I worked hard to try to get rid of PMS. And, and when I hit menopause, I didn't have those cold sweats like every or hot sweats, whatever. I watched women going, <laughs> I didn't have to do that. But what happened with my PMS is it went. So I had to go on anti-medication. I had to go on antidepressants till I got a handle on it. I'm 70 years old now, and th I thank God I weaned myself off the drugs, but I had to do that so I could get a control of it. And I'm not ashamed to say it. And I think if you need it, go for it. <clears throat> One of the things that we teach in our lodges and in our ceremonies, and I'm going to put this on my mouth so my lips don't stick together. Um, when you volunteer to help, and those wonderful ladies that have helped Patric Patricia and, who, and all the uh, professors who help their students, when you set out to help somebody, and there's a word in Cree, egispinatamasuin, egispinatamasuin, it is like breaking bread, you've earned something. But what you've earned is for you to define. Self-respect, the joy of sharing and giving because you've volunteered to do that. And that's what I tell people. Help around you if you learn something. In our sweat lodges, I also encourage people to um, Crawl in. Guess what? We slipped out of the womb. And we're going to go into the earth in darkness again. Because when we crawl in, the word is bimtatsumo, which means life crawling in with your story. So when we slip out of the womb, we're coming out with a story. And when we return to the earth, we're going in with all our story. That's what crawling means. I'm a hiker. I'm a walker. And there's a word for that again. Bimmute. Life eating heart. That's the literal dress. So my, li my walking in life, I'm eating life as well with my heart. I'm absorbing everything. So, when I was exploring intergenerational trauma, and I'm looking at my own intergenerational behavior, I was told there is no excuse, even though I went into therapy. So this is called, there is no excuse. Became a racehorse jogging at the field house Jane Fonda, the aerobic instructor, my guru, gave up alcohol, coffee, tea, soft drinks, uh, sugar, downed evening primrose oil, had vitamin B B12 injections, and a red and red. PMS, endometriosis, more PMS. Still, I crumbled onto the floor, fists gri gripping a hammer that held me, and the children scattered. The old ones called on, the old ones called on hand and knees. I dragged my story into the heat of the rocks. Water poured from my body. The therapist gave me a pillow. 
I grunted, spilled the parcels, exposed all the excrement. This one, where I consumed the white savages, love in alcohol fume bars, self-respect was a foreign word. The Cree who pried my legs, the woman scorned, you should have stapled your spoon like a Ukrainian pierogi, they told me. How does one function to think, to decide outside the home, away from residential school? Mama, what is choice? So I mentioned going back to ceremony, which formed my identity. It's a reclamation of my whole self. So this is the story of that. Legacy. I used a rusty axe to chop branches, create a frame for the buffalo hide to cocoon my spirit. I tied her with sinew, picked the em embedded pebbles, scraped the layer of fat, and smeared brain to soften the texture. I am looking through a crisscross and cracked window that distorts my vision. Sitting across the therapist, my heart is pierced with the burning lens of my truth, guided by her hand. Alone in deep forest, hunched inside willow and tarp, I sit with the beast inside me. Outside, leaves rustle, a skunk sprays. Face buried in my hands, I face the 200-year journey I've been on. I need to rest this weariness. For years, these, cut, these cuts scarred my heart, have not allowed me to forget the plow winds and tornadoes, the raging river, seething fire that tore from my body. I spewed on those that followed, their soft armor, yet not yet boulders to shield and protect their budding spirits. I learned the lessons well. At home, at residential school, throughout my adolescence and married life, and then on to my children. I carried Christopher Columbus across after he crossed a big pond carrying a cross. The weight splintered my arms, my legs. My boy emaciated amongst my Métis relations, his followers who killed the buffalo for the hide and pemmican trade. MacDonald thought he could he heal, he could tame the savages built us a residential school in 1883. From that day forward, the spines of my ancestors bent. Once strong and fierce laid down their weapons, we stopped breathing, our spirits numbered on a treaty card. In the monstrous rig red brick buildings, I listened. The little children, tongue-twisting arithmetic, they ask us how to spell arithmetic. A red Indian thought he might eat tobacco in church. Goosebumps, sweat on their brows, they lowered their eyes. To date, they ask, what is that number with a dozen zeros? Do I have any money left? Tongues stumbled with foreign words, fingers fumbled with their pencils, so they stay mute. Listen, continue to avert their eyes. For years, we carried all our sins. Our closets lined with iron clothes, bedspreads smooth with triangle corners. Our inherited rosaries whipped children during blackouts. Jesus is love, we were told. Love-starved daughters are dragged by the hair by husbands, mothers. 
Yes, we've survived. Though we've eaten the savages' foreign tongue, consumed their books, wore their black hats, gowns, and accepted the scroll, we, the sunrise risers, the dancers, will soar with the eagles. <clears throat> so, one of the things that colonization has done is ruined our families. That's not to leave it in a black place though. Many are coming back intact. And those of us, and those of um, some people actually hid their children, were able to maintain and go underground with our ceremonies and with our language and with the principles. This is for um, the next generation that I, uh, I um, my prayer for the next generation, okay? Netans, Nikusis, Nemusumak, my daughter, my son, my little grandfathers, you must define your own road. I thought I would make it easier if I went ahead in search of what was to lead us home. I walked, I watched as you walked the ditches, kick beer bottles, cigarette butts, scrapes of paper, watched as your backpack filled with library trees, their veins bleeding into your big heavens. Listen to Nutawi, Nigawi, your mother, your father, my life, History rages through your blood. The old man used to open his palms in a sweat lodge, mimic the voices of the government and churches, say, what are the policies? I sweated, swallowed this unwritten path. Now, my children, I am off this artery. Your birthmarks are rooted trees. It's up to you to gather the flowers, dandelions, sage, and sweet grasses to plant your garden. The old man said, everything is in you. All my relations, I, I thank you. Thank you. That was amazing, Louise. I'm not going to say that that was perfect, but it was powerful. <laughs> so thank you. I'm open to questions. <laughs> yes, we have questions. I think first, though, we have Madeline um, oh, Dion Stout that's oh, going to join us on. Zoom? Is that? Oh, just audio. Oh, just audio. Okay, great. Um, and is she here? I was able to be at the first inaugural lecture where uh, Madeline Dion Stout spoke and then endowed this lecture for going forward. And I know that her heart must be so excited that you're here uh, this evening as well. Um, do we just about have, yeah, it's coming. Thank you. There you go, yes. I'm going to Thank you, Louise, for, for your uh, wonderful, inspiring words. I'm going to say my prayer for the next generation, Louise. I'm going to use a lot of your thinking as I go through what I'm going to be saying and presenting. It's only a short little blurb. Um, and 
um, I just want to also underscore what you were talking about. Um, you mentioned truth a lot, and it made me think of how truth feels and facts know. You and I both went to Blue Coast Residential School. We know how we felt there and what the facts were uh, that were around us. So here's my prayer. My father holds the reins in his hands while my mother alights from the horse-drawn wagon. I fix my red rimmed eyes on my mother's red can. The splash of color, the statement, the heartbeat, the moment. Two hours later, I'm fighting for dear life. The parlor is stone cold, the bench is not wood, the windows large and paned. I beg my mother and father not to leave me. I cry until my nose bleeds. Then and there, colors fade, there is nothing left to say, hearts break and moments die. I surrender the loose change I'm left with to my superiors. I buy job, job breakers and black licorice pipes for a few weeks running. Strange is how they taste, on and off. Colonization, healing, and resilience reveal themselves to me. A survivor who drives waves of vulnerability for a lifetime and for generations. We were subjected to real risk factors including hunger, loneliness, ridicule, physical and sexual abuse, and untimely and unseemly death. As we struggled to throw off the shackles of colonization, we lean heavily toward healing, and resilience becomes our best friend. Today, troopers continue to work on my body, mind, and spirit, but ironically, they have given me a shot at life. My mother and father hoped they would. Why else would they have loosened my desperate clutch on them in the parlor? The resilience became mine. It had come from my mother and father's and now must spill over to my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. If we truly believe the pain of residential school has had an intergenerational impact, then it necessarily follows that there will be intergenerational survivors too. I firmly believe that a lot of healing began in residential school. I have asked myself and others, did I, did we suffer uselessly in residential school? Like any other question, I have ever posed to my mother, her answer might have been Tien de Dalis, which roughly translates to reflect on it, my daughter. The words spoken at this by at this selector by the bees have driven me closer to home and have me reflecting on my good fortune. I have been wearing your messages to me like the blanket. Blankets were gifted with. I say that our healing began in residential school, and I think of the times I lived secondhand love there. My great poor teacher, Miss Walker, spent as much time watching out the window for her RCMP boyfriend as she did watching over our students. I recall vividly her sparkling, flashing blue eyes and her pretty blue nylon blouse, the splash of color, the statement, the heartbeat, the moment. Much like what you were saying, Louise. I also remember looking 
up to a window and catching an unmistakable aura of affection between a free woman who worked at the school and her Denny shooter. She was radiant as she beamed down on us from the window large and leaning, while he strikingly handsome beamed at her. While I was deprived of love in residential school, I lived it second hand to the fullest. Love literally filled my empty heart and soul, so even though it was not rightfully mine. Second hand love just saved lives. Because of it, I can honestly say I began my healing journey in the most ungodly place. Healing is a midsection of a continuum with pain marked one end and resilience the other. Knowing what I know now, a large part of my response and yours to Louise to being and becoming in a godly place was an act of resilience. We were negotiating both sides of the middle. In the name of our best friend resilience, we can look forward to the future because we are very, very good at so many things, and so are our children and your children, Louise. Very accomplished people. We are very good at wearing splashes of color. We read, we wear red camps as a tribute to our beloved ancestors. We display our sundance flags and we proudly wear our Métis sashes and our northern prints, making a statement to whether we talk there, eagle, or monarchs. We are very, very good at acting in a heartbeat in the most ordinary way, at the most everyday level, as he said. Because as survivors, we help one another do the same. We are very, very good at living the moment while marking time by preserving residential schools as monuments, producing films about them, speaking about them as you did tonight, as your poetry, uh, very well understood and working together to keep important healing work going. In the name of our best friend, Resilience, we must give fervent thanks to our ancestors, our beloved elders, and our brothers and sisters, and for all the work in the service of healing that will surely be transformative when we look back. I just want to say to Louise, uh, you made things happen in your life from being a living part of your own life. That is um, commendable. And you journaled, and in your journaling, you had to ask hard and difficult questions. When I wrote to you, when I emailed you, I called you Miss Atlas. The root of that word is a chap, soul, or spirit. A chap is at our stars. You are my sister star, my soulmate, my sister in law. I really appreciated your poem that spoke to legislated identities, because that's what, where our new arena struggle is now, as you know. And you also spoke eloquently about the importance of attachment and bonding, and how it must happen from the time we are little to the time we go to PMS. Yours is an, an honest mirror, Louise. You are everybody, and everybody is you. And this oneness gives you a lot of leeway in being outspoken in a good way with your beautiful aesthetic genius. 
and you give protocol where protocol is due. In an assumed empty space, Luis, he opened the arms. He went to the wall, following the attacks to start to get by. But, 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 it's fast, it's fast to get. Thank you, Luis. We, we really appreciate how you've lifted us today. Your lecture has lifted us to verify heights, and we really appreciate that. And I know you said this too in your own words. Everything, whatever I believe on, I said my peace. I made my peace. I had the Manaskun in Tavos to me, where the peace one another. Thank you for your beautiful words tonight. Thank you so much, Madeline. And now we have time for questions and discussion. If somebody would like to ask a question of Louise, we'll give you a sec. Do you want some more water? We are good. Okay. Any questions? Yes. It's working? Oh, sorry. That was really a beautiful to hear from you and to hear you and Madeline speaking to each other. My name is Megan. I actually work here at the university and helped Madeline to get her Zoom link and speak. And I thought you two speaking together was so special. Can you respond to what Madeline said in terms of the memories and, and what she talked about? With the, I thought really resonated with me was when she spoke about that blue from you know the eyes of the, the woman and hearing that. I just love to hear what what you would respond to her and, and say back and give you a chance. Um, I have hearing aids, so I can only make, make a sense of some of it, but I really appreciate what she had to say. She said in Cree, Nitsakos, and she's absolutely right. It means my um, star, star uh, relative which means spirit and soul from the, the heavens. So uh, I'm really uh, honored to be called Nitsakos because that's what we call my sister-in-law. You know, it's a real close rela relation. And I'm very grateful for her compliments. And um, um, we need people like Madeline to, we are the followers of where the, we're following their footsteps and are working at carrying on what needs to be done. So I'm deeply honored to be part of that. Hi, hi. Yeah. Thank you so much for your amazing presentation tonight um, and to Madeline. Uh, Dr. Stout, um, I wanted to ask you, you were talking about your hiking and your walking, uh, and you did that as well last night at dinner. And as you were speaking, I was wondering, do you use your hiking and walking in these many, many trails that you've uh, walked upon um, as a methodology in your poetry or in your art? Um. Yes, I do. And when I was walking, um, how many of you are familiar to the West Coast Trail? Well, at six to nine years old, I hiked it. <laughs> um, you clap too soon. <laughs> I, um, I actually hiked it for two days and two full nights, and I had to get out on a third day because I sprained my ankle. Um, I was bruised all the way down to my, my, from my waist down because I was on anticoagulants. I had had a um, 
heart surgery, so they had put a stent and I was on medication. Um, but one of the things I did there was remembered my grandparents, okay? I would, I would chant what my elders taught me. And the chant would be is, you can do this, Louise. <laughs> the other chant was, one step at a time. <laughs> and, uh, and I would sing. I sang. And uh, I was really proud of myself because I didn't swear. I didn't complain. And I didn't cry. And, and it's a really grueling hike because we're climbing uh, 50 foot ladders with 30 pounds on our back. We are walking in um, uh, crossing, climbing over BC logs. They're big, right? They're, the the uh, trunks are really big. And slipping and sliding and falling on our faces and the boardwalks were broken. So yeah, I do a lot of walking. I walk every summer over 100 miles um, a week, like we'll do that in Saskatchewan. Um, but I don't think about the process of writing. I, I'll do that first thing in the morning. That's my process, okay? Is that, and then I'll reflect on what I learned the day be before. Because the sensor is sleeping first thing in the morning. It's not your guardian telling me, I can't say that, I can't do that. Because you're free from that sensor when you're wide awake and you're having your coffee. Because throughout the day, you always have sensors. He says, X, X rated, I can't say that, can't do that, you know, can't that, can't. Well, you want to tell the sensor to go to hell. Um, <laughs> but um, sometimes I don't write it until way after the fact when I've had time for a reflection and I need quiet time to do that. I'm very contemplative and uh, it's, more, it's important for me just to take time out from people and to spend time alone so I could listen to the muse, to the spirit. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, hi, my name is Maya. Um, I'm one of your daughter's students. Um, I, had, I was wondering if you could expand on how you mentioned that ceremony has become a really important part in revitalizing your identity. So, yeah, I was wondering if you could expand on that. Ceremony has become a really part, important part of revitalizing or reclaiming your identity. For us it is. We have to, um, um, in, in, in our community, yeah, it's really important so we can develop a healthier ad, uh, um, attitude about ourselves in our community so we can braid together the sweet grass, so to speak, right? With, uh, all the relations and everything. It's not just uh, human relations. Is but the planet as well. Yeah, it's really important. So, um, but I don't want to divulge too much on ceremony because um, if you want to look, there's enough literature out there to talk about it. And yeah, yeah. Hello, Louise. <clears throat> I've had the privilege to know this wonderful woman 50 years, and I have to freely admit that some of your poetry I simply do not understand. Um, some of the more recent stuff is easier for me, I think probably because I've come to know you a little bit and I understand a bit more. But one of the things that I would really be interested in, I know you had many other things that you did in your life besides write incredible books. How did you come to the decision to actually sit down and start writing a book and have the courage to present it, to be published so the rest of us could read it? Um, I didn't set out to be a writer. Uh, I think, you know, just because when I was escaping into the woods with my journal, it was a natural evolution. And then when I was in university, I was taking satellite classes because we were living in the north, northern Saskatchewan and I didn't have access to university um, in base. So it was through like Zoom satellite classes. And I was the only student in there. And um, I had a terrible time with English. And my English professor said to me, 
just pretending you're talking to me. So, so I, that's how I began is, is pretending I was talking to him on paper. And, um, and as you know, Peter has an English degree. My husband has an English degree and uh, uh, he would help me along. And then I went to uh, Patrick Lane. Patrick Lane is, is, is long gone now, but he was one of my favorite. If you want to know poetry, Patrick is really raw and truthful and honest as a man who's had to deal with all his demons. And he shares his story through poetry. It's just an incredible poetry. And I like that honesty. And so I took his class, a creative writing class, but I, um, I don't like to um, follow somebody else's poetry. I work hard at having my own voice. And um, he encouraged me to uh, go to uh, a writing retreat. And so I went in Saskatchewan for a, a writing retreat for about seven days with all these famous people that I was just learning about. And, and that's how Bare Bones and Feathers evolved. And um, they hadn't heard the story of residential school. That was back in 1994. And you know, Bare Bones and Feathers was an eye-opener to the general public, but poetry is not well respected in this country, and so it got put aside, even though it's become a classic now. Uh, so, um, so when I look at people writing novels and writing about residential school, it kind of pisses me off because Bare Bones and Feathers was born before them. <laughs> Maybe I'm jealous, you know. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted that people are writing that story. Um, because it, it, we cannot put it underneath the rug. We're, we've all been affected by it, every one of us, even though we're not directly involved in it. We are. History, Canadian history, is our inheritor. You know, so I don't know if that answers your questions, uh, Jane. Jane's my uh, husband's cousin. <laughs> yeah. There's two more, I guess. Um, you touched a lot on how through your lifetime with all the hardship that you faced that um, relationships were something that you had lost touch with, especially through the residential schools, um, and how through your finding your identity again was a long journey. I wanted to know... Um, what helped you get to a point um, reconnecting with your spirituality and everything like that um, to get to a point that you um, got closer and you found your husband and now l made that last 50 years? What was the key that you kept with you? Um, did the spirituality help or um, how did you go about that, your process? Um, both psychotherapy okay with with my psychiatrist and with my psychologist and with the ceremony with my elders is what integrated me and um it also helped me with my relationship with my partner and uh, he's not native and so we've had to cross all kinds of borders sexism uh racism uh, you know all of the isms and so but both of us are committed to, to learning and maturing together, and sometimes they're really hard discussions, but necessary discussions. And the other thing that I do is uh, I research everything. I research marriage, I research love, I research truth, and philosophy has all kinds of information, and I talk to people. I talk to people like my Oh, oh, here! How did you do that? How did you get there? Like, what made you successful? You know, I want to know their stories. I'm curious. Like my daughter's curious. I'm curious. I want to know everything. When I go to somebody's house, I want to look at how they're decorated. <laughs> because in residential school, the other thing we didn't know how to was to dress because we we had regimented clothing, and so when I left that system, I didn't know how to match this and that. You know. Um, it's, it's about the willingness to risk, the willingness to be courageous regardless if you fall on your face. 
I don't believe in failure. It's just another way of giving you an opportunity to learn from that mistake, whatever it's called, you know. So it's uh, perseverance, eh? And the other word that the elders used to say is uh, Montaneta, think for yourself, think with your heart. Very, very important. I could give you a whole bunch of examples that helped me with um, what my elders have taught us in Zerma. It's discipline. When I learned how to jog, five minutes at a time, ten minutes at a time, one telephone pole after another, five, ten minutes to that telephone pole, walk five minutes to that telephone pole, and I became a long distance runner. You know, so it, but discipline doesn't come easy. It's earned. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your questions. It did. Thank you. Thank you. So, so you've been a great audience. Thank you so much. Louise and Richard, I wonder if you could come up. We have a few gifts for you this evening for all the gifts you gave us. We have some gifts back to you. <laughs> first of all, I don't know, I'm taught you usually give Siva first, but uh, we'll do it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Louise, thank you so much. This is for you. And Barry, <laughs> this is for you. Barry Rich. Uh, some refreshments and time to visit. So enjoy.